Good morning. We are Beto and Raquel Tavares with our friend Thiago Mubak. We are from Brazil, from the Piratininga Vineyard. And uh, it's an honor to be with you wherever you are. And uh, what we want today is just to worship the Lord together, and praise His name. And as we sing these songs, just allow yourself to feel His presence and also to offer your heart, your life, this moment of your life before the Lord. Let's worship Him. Thank you, Father. We pray for your presence to be with us, not only as we worship you, but along this whole day. Let us feel your fire, your presence, your spirit, the renewing that you have for us. In Jesus' name. I came here to buy gold, refined in the fire, naked and poor, wretched and blind. I come, clothe me in white, so I won't be ashamed. I came here to buy gold, refined in the
God. You, we worship you, Lord. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name.
the earth once again with your glory with your presence come with your spirit and renew us renew your family Lord renew the body of Christ that we should shine as uh, lights of uh, house of lights of, of uh, as, as torches in your hands Lord let us be your witnesses over the nations right now in this moment that we live that would you would bless every family every uh, every ethnic group 
let Lord uh, your your praise and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord be known at this moment in Jesus name amen amen God bless you well, hello and welcome family and friends of the Vineyard Church in Katy, Texas. I'm so glad you could join us for another installment of our worship and teaching service online. As I always do, I want to remind you that we will be taking communion together at the end of this broadcast. And if you haven't done so already, this would be a great time to go and fetch the elements that you'll be using for communion uh, with us at the end of the service. Well, there is something that we have been seeing consistently over the last several months as we have traveled through the book of Acts. And I'm not sure whether you actually recognize this or not, but I want to point this out at the very beginning of this teaching session, and it's this, that people's lives are really changed by the gospel. They are really changed by the gospel and, of course, by the Spirit then who comes to confirm the gospel to them. And when I say their lives are really changed, I don't mean they become more religious or it's a little bit better. They literally are experiencing a whole new way of being human as a result of saying yes to the gospel and then simultaneously receiving the Spirit of God in them as a witness of this. And I touched on, on this point last week that kind of speaks into all this because this is, this is huge in the grand scheme of things. When I talked about our hearts being completely captured by the goodness of God in Christ. You remember this? This really is the evidence that people are getting the gospel right. Their hearts are captured by the goodness of God in Christ. Now, Little rabbit trail here, okay? Just travel with me for a moment for, before I get into the text. Why don't I just say the goodness of God, captured by the goodness of God? Because that would be so much simpler and easier. But I recognize that this, this teaching, this broadcast is going out beyond the Vineyard Church and possibly being watched or listened to by people who have yet to really recognize who Jesus is. So the reason that I say God in Christ is because I am not talking about just any God. I'm not talking about the God that so many people talk about today that actually is no God at all. And I know that sounds offensive and it's not politically correct and I want to care, but I don't because I care more about the truth because only the truth sets people free. And so when I say God in Christ, I am talking about the God who has actually revealed himself first through Israel and then through Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth through Israel to the world. So it's not just any goodness that I'm talking about, like we just have this kind of fuzzy idea about God being so good and loving us, and he is, but a specific goodness that is proven and revealed in and through Jesus of Nazareth, who is literally God come in the flesh. In fact, I was having a conversation this week with a, a relative of mine, uh, an older woman, a woman who lives um, in, in the Austin area, and she was talking to me about the, the television series, The Chosen. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to watch it or not, but she asked me if, if Deanne and I, my wife and I, had seen it, and I said yes, and she said, oh, Jeff, she said, I love this program so much because I have traveled throughout my whole life, and she's in her 70s now, with a confusion really about who God is and who Jesus is and how is Jesus related to God. And, and as I've watched this show and I've seen this portrayal of Jesus, she said, my heart is just absolutely captured. And she asked me, because she knows I'm a pastor, she said, are they doing this right? Are they portraying Jesus correctly? Is Jesus really that good? Is he that kind and that patient and that loving? And I said, yes, they are doing an excellent job of capturing the Jesus of the Bible. But I said, time out, let me tell you something. The story gets even better because Jesus is literally God come in the flesh. He is the word of God 
made flesh. Remember, we talked about this last week in John's Gospel. He starts the whole story out by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And I said to her, I said, listen, Jesus is God. If you're trying to put the pieces together, that's who God is. Jesus is is God come in the flesh. And she was like, oh my gosh. It was like the lights went off. She, it all came together for her. And this suddenly became the best news ever. It was like, what a wonderful opportunity in very simple terms to share the fullness of the gospel with somebody in my family who has been wondering, like I've just said, like so many people about who God really is. If you want to know who God is, you have to look at Jesus of Nazareth. So I'm talking about the God whom Jesus reveals. That's what I mean when I say God in Christ, that we must have our hearts captured by that goodness of that God, Jesus, who is the perfect and absolute fulfillment of the written promise to Israel that God would reconcile the world to himself through Israel and then come himself literally in Jesus of Nazareth, in and on the scene of real world history. The gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, tells us phenomenally good news. Do you know this? And the truth is, it would be unbelievable, quite honestly, if it were not so well corroborated and documented and predicted in the Old Testament. This is one of the reasons why I am so confident in the God that Jesus reveals and in the words and works of Jesus and in in the written evidence of the New Testament. And so I'm wondering, as I I say this, do you understand the gravity and the depth of of the reality of God in Christ? When When I say God, I am talking about the only true God who has ever actually revealed himself to the world both before Jesus came to Israel and then in and through Jesus' coming both to Israel and to the world. And this is the gospel, that God was in Christ and is in Christ reconciling the world to himself reconciling the world to himself. That's, this is the gospel. That's what he's doing. Not counting people's sins against them. 2 Corinthians 5.19. Now I know there, there, there are Christian people, churchy people who immediately are like, well, wait a minute. You, do you mean all people, Jeff? Because not all people. Can't be, not all people. No, relax. I do not mean all people. And neither does the Bible. It is quite obvious that in and through this goodness of God, that God is extending his salvation, he is extending his kingdom life, he is extending his offer to those who say yes to God in Christ. He does not force his goodness on people who have no interest in it. But for those who do say yes, he is literally reconciling themselves fully and completely and once and for all, not counting their sins against them and inviting them into an experience of new life with him. And so you know someone gets the gospel right because their hearts, I'm talking about the deepest part of who they really are as a human being, are now and forever captured by the goodness of God in Christ. And so I just begin this whole talk by saying to you, people's lives are really changed by the gospel and the spirit who comes to confirm it to them, to confirm the gospel to them. See, the gospel of God in Christ, this is the gospel, coming into the world on our behalf, it actually brings spiritual power for life transformation. It's not just another religion or another set of rules or something we're supposed to sort of figure out on our own through our own intellect. There is literal spiritual power, thanks to the Holy Spirit, who accompanies the preaching and teaching and proclamation of the gospel for literal life transformation. 
literal. God the Holy Spirit comes with the gospel to confirm to you and I that God is more than good. He's more than good. God's love and power, as Paul will so eloquently write to the church that he planted in Ephesus, as we have been reading about in the book of Acts, God's love and power is actually beyond human comprehension. It is beyond human comprehension. And I, I'll tell you, friends, whenever I find people who are trying to understand this on their own strength and get it all right and get it sorted, I know they, they do not understand the gospel. They are not cooperating and collaborating with the Spirit. They're trying to earn it or do it on their own. God's love and power is beyond human comprehension. Doesn't mean it isn't real, it just means it's beyond human comprehension. And I dropped a hint of this truth in last week's message when I mentioned Ephesians 3.19. I didn't read it, I didn't unpack it, but I mentioned it. And now, today, I'm gonna read it to you because this is what I wanna talk about today in this message. This is what Paul literally writes. It's the product of his church planting journey throughout the book of Acts. To the church in Ephesus, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart's through faith. Now I want to just pause here because I'm, I'm unpacking this text this morning. How does Christ actually dwell in our hearts through faith? Well, we know the answer to this through the book of Acts, literally by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Not just the idea of Christ, but Christ literally dwelling in you. Now, for this to happen, you've got to remember, you have to comprehend, you have to grasp that Jesus is God come in the flesh. He is the Word incarnate. And incarnate, maybe that's a new word for you, but incarnate means spirit taking on flesh, becoming embodied. And so now the incarnate Word is ascended into heaven. Jesus has been crucified. He is resurrected. He is now ascended into heaven in his glorified human body as God come from heaven and return to heaven. Remember what Paul wrote about, uh, about Jesus in Ephesians 4.10. He says, he who descended, Jesus, the word made flesh, is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. This is God in Christ. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the ascended one who was with God in the beginning, with the Father and with the Spirit in the beginning, has now sent the Spirit, which is His Spirit, to live in you and cause you and I to come closer to God today. That's what that means. That is how Christ literally dwells in our hearts through faith. It's not just, just through believing the right things, although that is certainly an important part of the equation. It's literally by the Spirit of Jesus. That's the language that Paul uses, among others, for the Holy Spirit of God. He goes on to write this, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So both the power and the love of God we see here are actually beyond normal human comprehension. You and I need assistance from God the Holy Spirit to have the power to actually grasp, to grasp. And I love this word grasp because what it means is that we, we have the capacity to actually grab hold of, to, to bring it to ourselves, to obtain it, to possess it, to know it, to, to be transformed by it, to comprehend it and the immensity of it all, this love of God in Christ. In fact, I like to put it this way, that this is what I call the physics 
of Christian spiritual transformation, right? These are the elements that must be in play if you and I are going to experience the fullness of the kingdom of God today in our lives. We must have the power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp, here's the physics, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This is the physics of Christian spiritual transformation. And the, this, these things must be present and they must also be primary for us. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. I'm speaking now again to my Pentecostal charismatic brothers and sisters of which I am one. If you and I don't get this right and get this first, you and I are not going to need miracles because we will not be becoming the witness of what God is really doing in the world through Christ. And as a result of that, we're not going to reflect him accurately into the world. In other words, if we think the power is just all for miracles and we don't recognize, as Paul is clearly saying, that it is first and foremost for our own transformation that we might live as witnesses in the world, then we have completely lost the physics of Christian spiritual transformation, of the way this actually happens to human beings who pledge allegiance to Jesus. Because you and I are meant first to grasp the love of God in Christ personally and transformationally first so that you can live in the power of the Holy Spirit as a witness to that above all else. See, and then, then, then maybe we can be trusted with miracles. Does that make sense? And he goes on to write this in verse 19, and here's the, here's the verse, the verse that I mentioned, the, kind of the, 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 the big idea. He says, and to know this love, to know this love, not just to know about it, to know it. This is the Hebrew idea of knowing, to know it with your brain and your heart and everything about you, your entire soul and spirit, to know this love, to grasp it, that surpasses knowledge. To know something that surpasses knowledge, you're going to need Holy Spirit help, right? Why? So that, listen to this, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is the point of everything. And I call this, this is, this is what I call grasping the gravity of the gospel. Grasping the gravity of the gospel. What happens when you truly grasp the gravity of the gospel? Paul says, you become filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is not just about behavior modification or sin management or getting our theology right. This is about complete and total spiritual transformation that works itself out in every single aspect of our experience of human existence. It works itself out in our, in our mind, in our will, in our emotions, in our affections, in our desires, in our wants. It even is supposed to work itself out in our bodies, which we hold Holy Spirit people have a tendency, tendency to completely neglect and forget because we think only spiritual stuff matters and physical stuff doesn't, even though God literally took on physical flesh to tell us your body matters. Spiritual transformation, when we get the gospel right and we grasp the gravity, the full gravity of the gospel, transforms everything. And, and, and when I think about this, it's, it's kind of a strange saying, this, this saying that you would become filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Like, what does that mean? Because this is the end and the point of it all, right? It literally means that you and I become more like God in Christ, which most Christian people I know today believe is completely inconceivable. They can't even imagine that that's possible, and yet it's literally what Paul is saying is the intended point of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Now, I, I will tell you, I, what I just read to you is from the New International Version of the Bible because that's the version that I prefer to preach from and to teach from. It's a little, it's a little easier to understand. It's, it's, um, it's more idea-based than word-for-word literal-based. But let me tell you, here's what the English Standard Version of the Bible, here's how it translates the Greek, which it does so more literally. I mean like word-for-word what's in the original language. The English Standard Version of this particular text, it says it this way. It says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. That's what we're shooting for. Meaning that you and I are actually meant to become more like Jesus who is God in the flesh. He is our example. He is our model. And he is our Lord and our Savior. Which is is the most important point for saying yes to Jesus in the first place. See, too many Christian people are walking around with this immature and undeveloped and unbiblical idea that the essence of the gospel is just simply to get you saved from your sins so that you go to heaven when you die. And in the meantime... What? Sin management? Behavior modification? Be a better person? Get your doctrine right? No. It's that you and I would be filled literally with all the fullness of God. And Paul means for you and I to begin that experience, that process, and that journey now as a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. Now, now, I don't know if you know this about gravity. I don't know how familiar you are with physics. It wasn't my best subject in school. But gravity affects everything that it comes in contact with. Do you know this? If you don't believe me, go to the top of the Shell Plaza building in downtown Houston or wherever you are, 50-story building, jump off and watch what happens. There's never an exception. Gravity affects everything that it comes in contact with. In fact, I I was looking for kind of a simple uh, definition of gravity. Of course, you can find it anywhere on the internet, but I loved this from nasa.gov because I think those, those space astronaut engineer people, they understand gravity. This is what they say. Gravity is an invisible force that pulls objects toward each other. That's what gravity is doing. That's why you and I are able to walk the earth because gravity pulls us towards the earth. It's always pulling objects towards each other. And if you get outside of the earth, you find gravity is at work in our solar system pulling the planets and everything toward the sun. Gravity affects everything that comes in contact with it. Now listen, the gospel is an invisible force that pulls people towards God. That is is what I mean by the gravity of the gospel. The gospel, the true gospel, the pure gospel, when truly comprehended and understood, is an invisible force. Paul says it's literally the power of God for salvation. It is an invisible force that pulls people towards God. God. It is like gravity. Now, we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about what else it does because, it, and I don't have time to unpack it, but gravity is all, I mean, the gospel rather is also an invisible force that actually pulls us to, to, to ourselves, to really to a healthy way now of living with ourselves, of understanding ourselves in light of God, of learning how to be honest with ourselves, not having to lie anymore or deny anymore, right? Learning how to be gentle with ourselves and kind with ourselves. It, the gospel literally, that, and this may sound nuts, but it helps to pull you closer to yourself. And you're going to need that because you can't love your neighbor at your, as yourself if you're jacked up in the way you love yourself. The gospel is also a force that pulls us towards other people because we come into a comprehension, as Paul just said, of the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love, the incomprehensible love of God. And lastly, the gospel is an invisible force that actually pulls us towards the world. Which I know many of you are saying, oh no, now I know you're a heretic, but I'm not. Jesus sends those who, people who are full of the gospel and full of the spirit 
into the world to be his representatives. So we'll, we're going to unpack that. We're going to talk about then what does it mean to be in the world but not of the world because the gospel, rather than causing us to have this hunker down fear-based mentality that because we're afraid we might be tainted or polluted, I'm not saying there isn't some wisdom, wisdom in that, but as you become transformed more and more into the likeness and the image of Jesus, let me tell you something, you become the light that's in the world and the darkness does not overcome it. But that's a conversation for a whole nother sermon. This morning, I'm introducing to you the idea of the gravity of the gospel. That The gospel is an invisible force that literally pulls people first and foremost towards God. And when it is properly told, which it oftentimes isn't, and properly understood, which it oftentimes isn't, and properly accepted, which it oftentimes isn't, because it has to be accepted or it has no power, it tells of God's reconciling love that literally transforms our lives, if we'll believe it. And the very Spirit of God accompanies the gospel with supernatural power to transform you and me from the inside out. That's why it's actually possible to become more like Jesus because the transformation isn't from the outside in like so many Christians try to do. It's literally from the inside out. It pulls you and me towards God. And as we get closer to God, we literally become more like him from the inside out. This is the gravity of the gospel. See, you and I are supposed to have overflowing joy. Do you know this? As we become more and more like God. God, those are Paul's words, not mine. And, and note, I didn't say that we become God or we become a God. We become more like him, like God in Christ, which is what you and I were created to be like in the first place. Scholars refer to this as the Imago Dei, the image of God. Do you know that you were created in his image and that God is restoring you to that image through the finished work of Jesus as you say yes to the gospel? You see, it, 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 isn't, it isn't just spiritual resilience, which I talked about last Sunday that's so incredibly important for our lives, especially in this cultural moment, that's born out of a heart completely captured by the goodness of God in Christ. It isn't just spiritual resilience that's born out of this heart captured by the goodness of God in Christ. It's everything you need for getting closer and closer and closer to the God who is perfect love and perfect power revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. I am talking about the same God who may allow calamity and disaster and pandemic in this life and in this age that we're living in right now because this life and this age we're living in right now is corrupted by sin and Satan and death, which, by the way, is the fruit of our choice, if you know the story as human beings, not his. But here's the beautiful news. In the midst of even that, God will prove himself immensely faithful to us in spite of us in the age to come. This is part of our gospel hope. When he returns in Jesus Christ to make all things new. We're supposed to be thinking of that and reflecting on that as part of our way of traveling as spirit-filled, gospel-filled people. See, God promised that he would come the first time through Israel, and he did. It's in writing long before he ever did it. He promises to come a second time with his church, and I guarantee you, you can bet your life on it, he will. But in the meantime, we live with the gravity of the gospel. We live with the gravity of the gospel. And not just once, it's not a one-time thing. We live with the gravity of the gospel every single day of our lives and all day of every day in our lives. And the message of that gospel is confirmed to us over and over and over again by the Spirit of God 
that God is good, that God is love, that he is heaven bent on rescuing those who say yes to the gospel and pledge allegiance to him from all of the effects of sin, Satan, and death, and rescuing us as well from the rightful and righteous judgment that is to come. And we need it to come. We want it to come. When God does away with once and for all everything and everyone that is opposed to his loving rule and his righteousness. How could God be good if he allowed sin, Satan, and death to continue on in the world forever? He wouldn't be. He couldn't be. So this is part of the love of God and the goodness of God and the gospel of God. And so I I finished this morning by asking you this question. Now that I've introduced you to the idea of the gravity of the gospel and what that means for us, the, the physics, if you will, so to speak, of real Christian spiritual transformation. Will you allow the gravity of the gospel to pull you closer and closer to God in Christ today? Will you, will you commit to rehearse the gospel? This is one of the practices and over the coming weeks and months, we're gonna be talking more and more about, okay, how do we do this? How do we actually practically do this? How do we live this life? Jeff, you're giving me all the the information for my brain. Now, how do I practice this out? Stay tuned, we're gonna be leaning into this heavily over the coming weeks and months. But here, here's a key for you to understand. Will you, you wanna feel, want feel this? You wanna feel me here? Will you commit to rehearse the gospel every single day of your life and all throughout the day to yourself? Here's your practice. What, do I have something to do in this? Yes. And as you rehearse this to yourself and you begin to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit confirming this gospel to you, uh, that, that, uh, that God is love, how high and wide and deep and long is the love of God for you in power. As you do this, will you look for opportunities to share the gospel with other people in its simplicity, like, I, like the example I just gave with my relative here in Texas. Just the simple, simple gospel. Do you know who Jesus is? He's God come in the flesh on your behalf to pay the price once and for all for sin, to reconcile to you, you to God, not counting God, no longer ever counting your sins against you so that you can step into the transformed life of the kingdom. And here's another question for you to consider this week. What habits and practices, addictions and affections do you need to surrender to Jesus? Like literally, what sins, we have them. What sins, let's just admit it, we are sinners. What sins do we need to confess to Jesus, the God who's come in the flesh, to to once and for all deal with our sins and bring his loving presence to us, that one that you can trust? What sins do you need to confess to Jesus right now and let him then transform you from the inside out with the power and the presence of his gospel and his spirit? What habits, practices, addictions, and affections do you need to surrender to Christ? What sins do you need to confess both today and every day? Just offer them to Jesus. God, what a refreshingly wonderful habit and practice, knowing that you are forgiven. It's not for him. It's for you. It's for me that we might recognize the gospel in our lives, right? What, what, what do you need to do to cooperate with this message that I've shared with you this morning? Now, here, here's a final homework assignment. Here's a practice for your spiritual transformation and experience of the gravity of the gospel in your own life. This week, I'm asking you to read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 once every day. Once a day to make this commitment. Once a day. It, just, it takes just a few minutes. 
but also to try and memorize as much of it as you can by heart. You're not going to be graded on this. It's up, this is all up to you. How much of the gravity of the gospel do you want to experience in your life? How much transformation, how much kingdom, how much love, how much power do you want? It's up to you. You get to participate in it to the degree that you want to. But I'm giving you this as an assignment to be helpful. Read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 at least once a day. Try to memorize as much of it as you can and then watch what the Holy Spirit does inside you as you let the gravity, the gravity of the gospel, the height, the depth, the length, the width, the gravity of the gospel transform you from the inside out. Because your life and my life is actually meant to be changed by the gospel and the spirit who comes to confirm it to you and me. I finish by reading to you Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And this is what Paul writes. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. God bless you, friends. Have a great week. In the book of John, Jesus had just finished feeding the 5,000 when the crowds swarmed around him. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, he said, comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let's pray. Lord, we bring you ourselves. And we remember your great sacrifice and all that you have done to reconcile us to yourself. We thank you, Lord. Lord, reveal anything that stands between us and you, that we might be clean before you, Lord. Amen. In the book of Matthew, the scripture reads, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat this is is my body. Let's eat together. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my body, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. We now celebrate the union that we have together, us with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We are a blessed community that draws our very life from Christ, and this life will have no end. Praise God. Truly, these are amazing words. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for my friends here. Bless each one of them, Lord, with more and more of an understanding of your mercy and your goodness toward them. 
And Lord, help us to rest in you, to seek you, to eat from you, and to know your goodness that it might pour out of us for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, my friends. Have a good week.